how are law and sin related to each other? That's what we're going to find out today in Romans 7. This letter is not even halfway over, but Paul is giving an education to these Christians in Rome, explaining everything about their history, Gentile, Jew, law, all the things that we have to do as Christians. When you look at the beginning parts of Jesus and his ministry in the gospel, he's saying these things, but now we're at the next step. We're ready to educate Christians to go, I don't know, further, to understand this better. And Paul is providing that for us. And he says that the law, when we know the law, is binding to us. Just like if I know what speed limit is on a road, if I know how many garbage bins I can put outside my house, I'm bound to them. Now, if I am in Montana, which is famous for not having speed limits, I don't see a sign. I'm not really bound by that law. I don't know what it is, and nobody's following it anyway. There's no law there posted. And so I don't even think about it. But just by the law existing, by the fact I know the law, now I'm bound to do it. Or at least when I don't do it, I know I am breaking the law. And he gives the example of a woman married to a man. If they are bound together and the husband dies, now she's free from the law. So the only way to get away from a law or a binding, or, you know, we were were talking about bonded servants, where I say, I'm going to work for you for the next seven years, and you will give me a parcel of land when I'm done. The only way I get out of that obligation is to die. Dying releases a person from that bound of law, like a wife or like a bondservant. You can see how the law holds people to that. But he says, likewise, you know, just like you and me, you also have died to the law through Jesus Christ. He, you were once bound to be in part of the law. We were all bound to be part of the law. I think that's where we were talking about John the Baptist and all the prophets beforehand repent, turn around. And that is how you satisfy God, by fulfilling a law that you couldn't possibly fulfill. He is pointing out in those times, look how hard this law is. You are bound to it. And people would fail at it. And so then they wouldn't know what to do. The the animal sacrifice at that time in the temple was set up just so that you could go and atone for your sin. Set up a spotless lamb to be in your place. But we get the idea from the beginning of time that there is a standard, this is the law, and we are not fulfilling it. And he was saying the only way out of it is to die, but we did die. Now we have died through Christ. He was raised from the dead so that we may bear fruit. While we were living in the flesh, old self, our old Jill self, our old Adam self, our sin is what caused us to live. It it was what rules we lived by. And then it says an interesting word right after that, aroused by the law. Why would our sinful passions be aroused by the law? And so I sat there and thought about it for a while and thought, you know what? The reason he's saying that is when someone tells you to do something, it is our inclination not to want to do it. We are just rebellious by nature. So if we see a sign that says 25 is the speed limit, we want to go 30. I want to go 30. I mean, I even have a rule of 10% over the speed limit. They'll never pull me over. We're just rebellious. And as soon as there's a law, a standard in place, as soon as you tell your child, this is the law of the household, or this is the law of God, do not go against it. Their first impulse is to actually just go against it. The other, I guess, interesting part of this whole paragraph is the fact that he said we have died to the law meaning we are not waiting for that day when we go to heaven where we will be released from the law. We have already died to the law. Jesus already birthed us into a new birth apart from the law. We are now part of the body of Christ. So we have died already to the law, and we were raised up to live a different kind of life, just like Jesus was laid up in the end, so that we may bear fruit for God. We're going to be that fig tree that blossoms because now we're released from this old self, this old Adam, this old Jill. And all that work we did in our old self, that bore the fruit of death. So we're released from the law because we were held captive. Jesus' death 
released us, he says, quote, having died to that which held us captive so that we serve in a new way of the spirit and not of the old way of the written code. All these things that we're told to do, and I would know, right? Again, Pharisee, he was the guy who was trying to follow every bit of the law, do every type of thing, follow the Sabbath perfectly, follow everything perfectly. He missed the part where the people around him and maybe even himself were not following through on the word of God and and failing. So now what do you do once you have failed? Now we have Christ and we are no longer held captive. We serve him. What I like about Paul, but makes it entirely confusing, is that he can hear the debating people debating against him. Well, what shall we say? The law is sin. So we only sin because the law exists. And because we were slaves to the law, we were slaves to sin. Is that what was being said? And he said, if it hadn't been for the law, I wouldn't know sin. Meaning that whole thing I was saying, like, if you don't see a speed limit sign, if you don't see a stop sign, if you don't know how many garbage bins you're supposed to have in your front yard, you don't even know. You don't even know that you're breaking the law unless the law is posted. So he wouldn't have known, he said, what covet was. You know, he would not have known that he was breaking the Ten Commandments had it not been for the Ten Commandments pointing out what it is he was doing. So sin is seizing, he says, that opportunity through the commandment to make me covetous. I think it's where I was saying where you suddenly are told, don't do something, and suddenly it's the one thing you want to do, right? That whole, don't think of pink elephants thing where then all you can think of are pink elephants. As soon as someone tells you, don't do that, that's not the way you should live, suddenly it is our nature to think nothing else but that. And he said for him that he once lived apart from the law. So this was a time in his life, and I'm sure every person who grows up in the church or grows up in the temple knows a time where they didn't know what they were supposed to do or not do. They you know, probably had parents telling them what to do, but they didn't know the law of God. And as soon as he knew the law of God, suddenly he understood he was dead in sin. He knew he couldn't fulfill it. And it convicted him to know there was no way out. There was no way for him to do this. And so he said the very commandment, the very law that promised life, gave me death because suddenly I knew all the things I was messing up. Sin is reaching out and, gra- and going through that commandment, and it said it deceived him and killed him. Even though the law is holy and the commandments are good, sin uses that opportunity of rebellion in our own soul. Think about Adam and Eve, right? The snake's like, oh, well, did God really say that? As soon as you know what the rule is, the devil works on helping you avoid the rule and commit a sin. In the end, we know that punishment for sin is death. But through that death, through the baptism, uh, our old self died, was buried, and we were raised with Christ. Now living apart from the law, not that the law is bad, but the law is not convicting us anymore. God looks at us and says, not guilty. And so that leaves us free from sin, free from the slavery of sin, because we are no longer bound to the sin that happens. We have the Holy Spirit in us. And so we have that ability to not look at the law as something that is condemning us, but look at Christ who is releasing us from our sin and helping us to bear fruit, lead that life of holiness, sanctification, as we talked about in the last episode, and being a new being, now one, producing good fruit with God. See see how complicated that got? But he said then, Is it that good then that is death? And again, by no means. It was sin producing death through me, through what was good. So sin is using this pathway. It has corrupted what is good, which is God telling us his law and now corrupting us. So we sit there and think, I want to break the sin. Because the law is there, suddenly we're rebellious. We want to break the law. We want to do the thing we're not supposed to do. We want to speed where there's a speed limit posted. We want to blow a stop sign. We want to do all the things that we should not do because the law is posted and because our old nature was to go through and break every rule we possibly could. And he says, I don't understand my own actions. 
because I don't do what I want to do and I do the thing I hate. Boy, can't you just recognize yourself in that? That there are times when we know we should follow a certain path. We shouldn't say the angry thing to our parent or we shouldn't steal from our company. Maybe that is working a half day when we're supposed to be working a full day. There's all sorts of types of stealing out there besides sticking something in your coat and walking out with it. We have that rebellious nature in us all the time. And so he says, I try to do things and I don't do them. And he can't live within it. So what's he going to do? And for someone who was a Pharisee, well, this was like the ultimate crime. They were trying to do everything right because somewhere in the back of their head, they thought they could, that they could do the very right thing all the time. But now he knows, he says, that the sinful flesh dwells in him. And it's no longer him anymore who sins, but that sin that dwells inside of him. I am raised up with Christ. I have the Holy Spirit living within me. But there is still sin that dwells inside of me, and it's doing the bad things I don't want to do or preventing me from not doing the good things I want to do. I mean, I've had some... I don't know, opportunities to sit there and think about the things I do in my life. And I think, well, I don't have to do all this stuff. I don't have to have a podcast, right? I could just go back to playing my video games and reading books and knitting on my couch. Those are all good things. There's nothing really wrong with any of it. But now I'm not doing the good thing I want to do by doing this podcast. Podcast takes a lot of time. Would it be nice if I had my time back and I could do what I wanted to do? And then there was that quote from someone who I wish I could remember who it was who said, the devil can't get you to change your mind, then he'll get you to sit on the couch. Think about how many times you maybe had a great idea to reach out to someone, to pray for someone, and instead you ended up doom scrolling on your computer or watching a movie on Netflix, and you didn't do the good thing you were hoping to do. It is that still that sin dwelling inside of it, but that's not who we are. And Paul says that nothing good dwells within me, in my flesh have the desire, he says, to do the good thing, you know, for the right things, but he's not able to carry it out because the evil that's inside of him still wants to keep doing the other thing, either doing the evil thing or not doing the good thing. It's still hard for us, and we have to pray, I think, to have God help us in this struggle. We are, he says, waging a war against, he calls it the law of my mind, making me captive to the law and to the sin inside his body. And wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? But he says at the very end, quote, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. So we are getting there on that day where Jesus calls us back to heaven. We are there in heaven. We'll no longer have this battle anymore. But until then, it is going to be a battle and it's going to be a continuous battle. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the ability to pray. We know how this battle is going to end. It is going to end with us being that being that Jesus looks at us and sees. I think about parents, right? When they look at their little kids and they say, oh, you know, my son he is such a caring man. He's going to make a great doctor or nurse. Or my daughter, she's great with math. You know, she's going to be sometimes a scientist or a teacher, something like that, a, an engineer. And they see the potential in their own children. And then when the children grow up, they're kind of living a life on their own and they don't see their own potential. But God looks at us and sees that potential, sees the thing that we could be, sees the things and the fruit we could be producing that we're not because we're constantly in this fight with our sinful self, not doing the things we should do and doing the things we shouldn't do. So it's always going to be that battle for us. But at some point, that potential that we have is going to be living out in us. And that ends chapter seven. What I'm going to meditate on is that inability, as Paul says, to do the things he wants to do and not do the things that he doesn't want to do, and yet that is how it ends up happening. And how sin takes that route through righteousness and shows sin to us because now we know better. We know the law and we know what we shouldn't be doing. And yet our desires inside of us want us to do those things. And so we ask for God 
And it's just going to be this constant battle. And what I'm going to pray about is for God to help me in this battle. He says that he will be there for us. And so what we can do is pray, pray to be released from these sinful bounds that hold us, pray to be, be released from the sinful nature, to do the work, to produce the good fruit, to live up to the potential that God looks at us and sees. It's not going to be perfect until we get to heaven, but at least we know that in Christ we have died to the law, died to the sin, and are brought back into a new life and have at least the potential to produce the good fruits that Christ calls us to produce and the good fruits that we wish to produce. I mean, don't you wish that you had that healthy, happy existence where you were living for God, living in that full potential he sees in you? And what I'm going to share with others is the fact that Jesus said that he came to fulfill the law not to remove it from us, but he is the one that brings us justice inside of the law so that when we are judged by the law, the law says not guilty because Christ paid for each and every one of these transgressions against the law. The law itself was good. It was teaching us how to live the kind of life God wanted us to live, but we couldn't do it. We would fall short. We would sin. We would do the thing we didn't want to do. And you know what? Jesus is there to bring us into a forgived level that his grace, his triumph over sin is going to be our triumph over sin. And it's going to be a struggle while we're here on this earth, but at some point the struggle will be over and the victory is already done in Jesus. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate listening to the podcast. Please remember to email me at jill at startwithsmallsteps.com. Also remember, I have another podcast called Buzz, Blossom, and Squeak. It's all about the glorious nature that God has created, the systems and the animals and all the really miraculous things he made in this world. We explore them, we don't worship them, but instead we try to learn a little bit more about them so we can appreciate the world around us just a little bit more. And please everyone have a wonderful day. <music>